it. Well, I've been making cabbage now probably for about 10 years. Some years it has not turned out at all. Some years I'm ending up throwing away probably about 15 heads of cabbage because it turned black on me. So what you do is you start get your nice cabbage heads, clean them off, and you want to keep these bigger outer um, leaves and save them for later because that's what will be put on top the shredded cabbage and after you get it all shredded. And then it's pretty much just putting it in here and just going. Usually my husband does this. Watch your yep. Workbenches. Yep. So then. Yep. So then, once we get it, we usually have it in like that different container, and then we try and. Yes, my mom usually always brings a metal dish pan that she had. It's an old one, and she knew how much cabbage went in there and about a handful of salt always went into there. She mixed it up. We'd let it stand for about a couple minutes, and then we would dump it back into this crock. And then we would go and then take our fists and just stomp it down because the salt will kind of make the juices come out of it. So we would just stomp it down and let it kind of sit. And we, what you want to do is have the juices come over the cab over the shredded cabbage. And that's so we just keep going till we had it all done, all pressed down so there was probably this much liquid because that's what you want to do to seal it so air does not get into the cabbage and rot it. And then as it's going, it will ferment, so bubbles will come out. And then you check it every once in a while and then kind of scoop if there's some mold on it, it that's okay. And that, and then um, usually what I do then is after I get done with m how much I want to put in there, I take a plate. And then I take about three one-gallon bags of Ziplocs filled with water. And I double bag them because one time we had one bust. <laughs> so then I just put them on top, on top that plate and just make sure that the juices are up above it, you know, above that plate and that, and then you let it ferment for about five to six weeks. You know, but you know, and at the end, it's right before you put the plate on, you fill just these in there, just cover them up just pieces, you know, to co make a, you know, about probably two, three layer of this to cover it up and then put your plate on. And then after it's done fermenting, lots of times I go just by the time. People say go with the bubbles, but I'm kind of just do it like five and a half weeks. I'll do it and then just take it out and then I'll put it in baggies. I freeze mine in baggies because I didn't never had enough jars. And then at one time you couldn't find lids because of COVID. So then I just bag them up uh, two um, cups uh, in a bag and then I just freeze it. And that's the way I do mine. I don't put them in jars or anything. And that's pretty much it. It's kind of, it's easy, you know, once you kind of figure it out. So now I have it figured out where to put it in my house, where, you know, by, you know, so that it's a consistent temperature and doesn't go up and down in temperatures. Not, so. so all it is is cabbage and salt? Cabbage and salt, yes. No, no seasoning? Nope. Oh, that's Some people put in. caraway in it. Mm -hmm. I never oh, cared for yeah. caraway. So I know a lot of old, the older people put caraway in it. Mm -hmm. yep. And this is kind of like the finished prod product. I know it sometimes it's, it's not as white as what you see in the grocery store because they don't do the same process. What you buy in the grocery stores, I think they just add vinegar to cabbage. It doesn't ferment or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I had read somewhere at one point. So I don't know, mine was never really white. It was always that color and that's the way my mom's and my grandma's was all the time too. So I have recipes here if you want to try it. But a lot of people sometimes too, on the recipe it says you can use either a knife and just cut it really thin or a food processor. So it's not like you need a kraut cutter. <laughs> yep, yep, I got somebody to, and somebody to do it. And then you have it. to do it in the crock? 
No, people in there also in that recipe, it says five gallon buckets. Oh, okay. If you have a food grade five gallon bucket, you can do it in there also. Okay. And it says just with the plate and lots of times too, my mom always said, make sure whatever container you put it in, make sure the plate goes pretty close to the edge. Because she said sometimes if it doesn't, she says that's kind of where it kind of rots is yeah. down if the plate would be pulled this far away from the edge. It turn, kind of turns black in there then. Okay. So. Well, that's interesting. I didn't yes. know how sauerkraut was made. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, it, it's pretty easy. It is. In that, yep. It's just a... in the ground to kind of tear those outside roots because what happens is the cabbage usually cracks when it rains a lot it sucks up so much moisture and that's why they crack so then you just sit there and you kind of turn them a quarter turn and I've already done it a couple times quarter turns and all you're doing is just tearing those little roots off from that main root Yeah, because I used to have it too, so many cracks, so many didn't, and it was, then I ended up buying some, and so I can yeah, so last year I did that with the turns, and I didn't have one that cracked. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, took, well, it took many years to figure that out. <laughs> a lot of reading. Yep, a lot of kind of research and that. Yeah. So do you can everything? Yeah, uh, you can all, all that stuff okay. I did can. This yes. is your garden or Turbo's? Well, this, this is, is Turbo's. Turbo's. My garden I have at my, my parents' house, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much have everything out there, too. And my mom still has a garden, so it's kind of like both. If she doesn't have something, I'll have it. Yeah, I kind of inherited one of her gardens, and it was one of the big ones. It, that garden was, is like 16 feet wide by 72 feet long, and then plus she had another Not, no, not that much. Okay. Lots of times I do it and I give her the stuff. Yeah, because it's just, I don't know. Nice. She just thinks as she's getting older, it's a lot of work. It is. <laughs> Everything is. Yep, and even like these too, if you guys ever remember these with yeah. the tomatoes. Well, that's for your tomatoes, yeah. Yep. Of course, I'm making tomato juice. Tomato juice. I don't know what they would do, what they did, like now after this, if you want to juice something. I don't know what the what the modern thing to this. Oh, yeah, so then what do they do? Just um, sure. cut up all the seeds and everything? Sure. Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> it would work. <laughs> the juice? Yeah, I, would, I do the stewed tomatoes with the seeds in. I try and get... Yeah, some of the, uh, lots of times when I cut the tomatoes, I'll knock a lot of the seeds out of there just to get them out so it's not full. But then um, the juice, I will, um, the juice, I'll do this thing. Donna, what is this for? What was that for? We used that oh. for making sausage. Oh. And we used it up to not that long ago. It's those copper boilers, but only the bottom is copper on this one. It must be a cheaper one or whatever but my mom always put it like on the stove on two burners oh, yeah. it would have and, hot water in it yep and we she would boil the meat in there yeah. okay yeah. Mm -hmm. just for the end mm -hmm. and this that's uh, what color 24 it's a four pound four, four. four gallon four gallons. yeah and that's old that when my grandma got married she found that in the basement of her their house when they moved in there and I think if my grandma would be alive, she'd be 132 years old or something like that. So you figure that's for sure at least way over 100 years old. Right. I think so. I would think <laughs> probably grape wine or I'm sure oh, they yeah. made the wine back then. Sure. Yep. Very 
any recipes there's some for the dilly beans or the spicy green beans and the pickles even the pickled beets are pretty easy to make too are they yeah those are pickled, pickled red beets mm -hmm. yeah and it doesn't take very many to make a batch of, of those pickled beets, beets. Oh, yeah really? mm-hmm yeah, that'll make probably that batch about four or five jars, pint jars. And I usually use just pint jars because it's only the two Too of us, you. and mm -hmm. then it seems to go to waste. Very nice. Mm -hmm. These are older boxes. I yeah, think. they are. I mean, look at the price, $1.19. <laughs> For the whole stuff. Yeah, and they're still in there, too. $1.19, <laughs> huh? Mm -hmm. kind of informal um, speech about just pollinators and you know why I'm here what I do um, so the reason why you guys are here is just trying to promote pollinator habitat right everyone loves like the bees the butterflies um, the birds that come along with it a main a main thing we always look for in the pollinator habitat is that we want to bring those insects in but the birds and everything um, the nests and the baby birds need to eat the insects as well to support life um, in that realm so, as you can see, Ruth has done a great job, but just the garden all together, um, trying to incorporate multiple species. Biodiversity is very, very important. Um, so having, you know, different types of family species and having them intermixed as well, um, so they can hop from, from flower to flower. Um, back in history, uh, there, it used to be Minnesota and even into Ohio and kind of all around used to just be full prairie. Um, with deciduous forests kind of as we go up north and then you have your big woods. Um, but as, you know, the, we kind of industrialized things and um, like urbanization came through, we kind of started wiping out some of the prairies. You know, it was something to be conquered as it was super intense. You have those deep roots and so they came through, um, started farming. And so now we're only left with about 1% of our prairies, um, which means the, the bees and everything that we love and need aren't don't have as much habitat as they once used to so trying to get that back in um, into production is kind of our main um, our main goal here so as for me I work with the Scott Soil and Water um, here in Scott County so we help landowners with um, technical assistance of projects conservation projects um, promoting just any type of um, conservation that you can do on your land is kind of our main thing so everyone can do can do something whether it just be a 150 square foot pollinator garden or you know a vast pollinator meadow so start somewhere um, but we have lots of fun programs um, we do pollinator garden rain gardens um, pollinator meadows native shoreline buffers um, and then we have other staff in the office as well who do more of the egg side of stuff. Um, but for me, I'm kind of the, the native prairie gal, so I talk all about the, the native... Oh, every, we got more coming in. Um, but yeah, so it's just more or less promoting those um, birds and butterflies on our land. Um, they only can go so far to forage, so having corridors here and there. Um, is, is super important. So I'll kind of leave it at that. If anyone has any questions on anything, feel free to come ask questions. But other than that, we have um, lots of resources here about where to get native plants, native seed, um, and then we can always help with the technical assistance side of it. So thank you for coming. Do you know, I, I, I found this really interesting yesterday. I was out here with the neighbors and they have a little girl, uh, she's five or six years old. And there was a bee out, and oh. and she's she's definitely afraid of bees. Oh. And I'm like, oh, we have lots of bees yes, here yes. all summer long. So she's yeah, she's gonna have to deal with learning to live with bees. <laughs> yes. so. and it is the education side that comes along with it too. You know, like bees and butterflies and everything. Um, even though they 
they do have stinger and things. If you don't bother them, they uh, we need them for pollination yes. and we need them. So yeah, I just be you know like education that's relaxed right. when it came flying around me, and she's just like yeah, and she's <laughs> like, what are you? Yes. Run away! <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, yeah. It's good to see them though. They're starting to emerge. So, mm -hmm. good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Cool. All righty. Well, thank you yes. for yes. Anything here you guys need? Talking about you know some of my favorite things. Yes. Oh, it's lovely to have you. Lovely to be here. and been retired for two years. I live in a geodesic dome south of town between Montgomery and New Prague. My address is Montgomery. My phone is New Prague. I am the great-grandson of John Quirk, who was an Irish immigrant escaping from the famine in the, in the 1840s, coming to the United States uh, becoming a citizen in Pittsburgh, coming by railroad and steamboat to St. Peter, Minnesota, where he met Margaret Smith, who became Margaret Smith Quirk, my great-grandmother, and 13 children later, my grandmother was born. John Quirk, in 1856, purchased the land that I grew up on in Lee Sewer County between Lake Washington and Lake Jefferson. On that land, I manage uh, 70 acres of, of conservation reserve, I call it. About 30 acres is a tall grass prairie that's been developing for 30 years. What you see out the window here is a developing prairie, uh, but uh, one of the things I would say about myself is I'm not sure I should say I created the prairie as much as it created me. It's been teaching me a lot about who I am as a human being, as someone who comes from the earth. And I think being close to the earth is very important for all human beings. That New York City has Central Park in the middle is no accident. I can't imagine living in that concrete and asphalt jungle and not having parks to go to just to get your head screwed on right, you know? So prairies, and I know this whole event is sponsored by the New Prague Historical Society, but I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about prehistory, prehistoric society. In a prehistoric world, in the early Earth, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The atmosphere of the Earth had very, very little oxygen. A lot of the atmosphere was carbon dioxide. And the first form of life that came to the Earth was vegetation. If you or I were back there, millions, maybe billions of years ago, and would try to breathe. We could not breathe. There wasn't, any, there wasn't enough oxygen in the air. So what happened is vegetation started. And for millions of years, the vegetation was taking the carbon dioxide in the air, taking the carbon atom off of that, building the, the vegetation's body, I mean the trees and the grass, that's mostly carbon. But the carbon came from the air, and it, and it takes the oxygen and puts it out into the atmosphere as, uh, as O2. That's what we breathe. So reptiles and mammals and all animal farms, we need oxygen. And so you can thank the green world, the green vegetation and the trees, for giving you the breath that you breathe. So there's a real connection between our individual lives and the natural world. It's very, very important to, to have that in, in how you understand yourself. Let me say some things, welcome, uh, about prairies itself. In nature, there is a war between forests and grasses. 
in Minnesota before our European ancestors came here and the native people were here. If you would draw a line from northwestern corner of Minnesota diagonally across the state to the southeastern corner, everything west of that line was tall grass prairie. No trees. We're essentially in the big, big woods. You go out by Elysian out there. That is kind of the boundary between the, the great plains and, and the big woods. And so my great-grandfather, when he came from Ireland, came into this what we call wilderness setting, this natural world, probably had to do a lot of tree chopping. And, but if you were an immigrant that ended up in the bottom of Lake Agassiz, which is out there in western Minnesota where it's really flat, you had about 10 feet of topsoil. And it takes a prairie 200 to 300 years to make one inch of topsoil. And the prairie roots go down six to 10 feet. And so forests sequester carbon. They take carbon dioxide out of the air, put oxygen out back in the air, and then put carbon down into the ground. And so do grasses. I mean, how did the oil and the coal get in the ground? It took millions of years of plants growing and dying, growing and dying, to put carbon in the ground. So th that's where we came from. We, we are, our individual human lives are very interconnected with the natural world. And way before uh, humankind or mammals came on the surface of the earth, the plants were building the atmosphere that we are breathing. What's happening is in the last 100 years, because of the wonders of industrialization and all of the stuff that we have, we're taking that sequestered carbon that's down in the ground that took millions of years to go, and we're putting it back in the air with carbon dioxide. That's a problem. That's a problem. I won't go into that, but that is the case. Let me say something about the difference between forests and grasslands. Forests sequester carbon. A tree has about 50% of its carbon in the ground. The other 50% is what we see, huh? And, and uh, that, that's all great. So a lot of people plant trees. Prairies do that even better because about 70% of a prairie plant is in the ground. What we see is 30% of the plant above ground. And the prairies fight the forests by starting themselves on fire. <laughs> and boy, if, if you've been into a, an established prairie and it starts on fire, you're dealing with an immense amount of heat. And I, I remember the, the distance was about from here to the house and someone was with their cell phone recording the fire. And the cell phone said, we're closing down because the cell phone is overheating. So the radio, and she had to stand like this because the heat was so. And a prairie fire, if you were on a covered wagon going across the prairie, and off in the distance you'd see the smoke and wind was blowing this way, not a good thing. So two choices. One, you start a fire right here to burn this prairie grass, and then you stand in that burned area, and that prairie would burn to you. Or you dig a hole, and you bury yourself, and hope it goes over, and you survive. If you don't survive, that's your grave. So this was really something. So when the pioneers came, they couldn't break the sod until the... Uh, John Deere, uh, I assume it's steel bottom plow, maybe iron bottom plow, could get into there and cut off all of the heads of the prairie plants. 
And as soon as that happened, the prairie is gone. Most of the prairie seed, a lot of the prairie seed that we have, we got from the railroad train tracks on either side that never got, that did not get plowed. There are a few original prairies, but one of the things about a prairie, soil erosion stops immediately. But my great-grandfather got this fertile land and planted oats and wheat, and my God, with all of that grass, keeping the soil fertile, and the wheat just took off, and the corn just took off. And, but after year after year of plowing on these rolling hills, the topsoil up here goes down here. And so you see a lot of the, the hills are clay. That's because the topsoil is down there. And so soil conservation. So prairies produced the fertile land that, that Minnesota is made up of. Now I'm going to stop there and allow you to make some comments. And I know it is 11.22. So where else do they, like, Minnesota had a lot of prairies, but Dakota, the Dakotas too? Or There's different prairies in, in the, you go further west and you get into what, the short grass prairies. We had tall grass. My big blue stem is up like this. And Indian grass, and then, but on the on the on the tops of the hills, the the little blue stem or the side oats grama, which are short grass that do very well. So the prairie seed sorts itself out according to what what. It's very interesting to see the prairie unfold year after year and become more and more prairie. When you plant a prairie you need to be very patient and you have a plowed field you go in there with the brilliant cedar and you plant it and then for the first two years you keep the vegetation that's growing between six inches and 12 inches because you the aggressive non-prairie plants take over and you chop off their heads and and then that allows the, the, the prairie seed to sink its roots. That's where, where they go first. They go down. And then they're just little, and then they get bigger and bigger as the years go by. So right now I've got compass plants up like this, and sunflowers up like this, and cup plants, and very strange lead plants and all of this stuff. And when you burn the prairie, and I do it every three years, that gets rid of all of the accumulation of vegetation because the prairie, if you don't burn it, suffocate the plants. And then the flowers that next year take off. So with two thirds of my prairie burned, the flowers and the grass and this rain are just taking off here. So you fight with Canadian thistles, but once the prairie gets established, Canadian thistles can't make it. So I asked, uh, there's some real prairie nerds that know all of the names of the prairie plants, both what we call them and also the Latin botanical name, you know, and I go, how can you keep all that straight, you know? But, uh, let's see, my, my point was here, well, I just lost my train of thought. My train goes off the track every once in a while. Any comments, thoughts? When you see like farmers or I don't know, farmers or counties like doing burnouts in fields, is that like to get rid of what they don't want, like invasive species, and then to replant? What, what's interesting is in the spring, prairie plants are largely what they call warm season plants. The soil temperature needs to increase in temperature before they will say, okay, I'm going to take off. Non-prairie plants like crabgrass and brome and Canadian thistles and other, other weeds, they start right away. As soon as the frost is out of the ground, boom, they're going for it. And so in May, you see your prairie plants not growing, 
but you see the greens started coming, you start the prairie on fire. And any tree seedlings there, they are toast. And, and the, the, the prairie fire goes across it, and, and that turns the soil black, it warms up the soil, and the, the tough, the stuff that's, that's there, turns into ash or carbon dioxide, and, uh, and then the prairie jump starts. So two thirds of the prairie this summer, or the spring, spring where it was burned, my gosh, it, it's doing so well. But you know, I, I now remember what I was going to say. You're talking to a, 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 someone who really knows the history of prairie, and there's a few original prairies, never been grazed, never burned, but they're rare. Said, I asked them, okay, I've been doing this for 30 years. How long will it take for this to look like an original prairie? He says, 300 years. I saw, well, isn't that encouraging? <laughs> okay, comment? You're welcome. Thank you. white tank top. So these two ladies were the brain children for this. They're the ones that came to us and said, you know what, you guys come on up here. I want to, Marsha and Kelsey, come on up. And they said, you know, let's do a garden tour. This could be so cool. We could incorporate history and all these really neat things. And I said, let's go for it. So um, all of us board members, a lot of, obviously all of you community members and you gardeners that have um, volunteered and supported us through this, we just thank you so much. This day has turned out to be wonderful. We're very blessed that the rain held off, and that was not something that we had to manage today, so we're very thankful for that. So, Kelsey and Marsha, would you guys like to say anything else? I am just amazed and, and proud and pleased of all these people that supported us. They came from all over, and it was, it was just like, you just, wanted to, you just wanted to cry? Because you just think, ah... Who's gonna come? Maybe six, and that's what, and that's what we thought. I can do, I can do it fine without my. <laughs> and, and to see you, and, and and the interest that you had, and the chatter that was going on, it just, I really didn't feel like I could just break down and cry because it was just such an awesome experience. And thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. So just another quick thing um, on the back there. I do have a basket, comments, suggestions, things you loved, things we could do better, and um, suggestions for uh, different events we can do in the future too. We'll be reviewing those and then making notes for next year to hopefully do something similar, maybe something different we don't know yet. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce... Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you want to check. Check and then, yeah. We might have some extra lunches if anybody would like to take them home for supper tonight. Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dennis Dvorak. Dennis Dvorak um, was here since the beginning of the Historical Society. He's one of the original members, and we like to call him the um, walking encyclopedia of New Prague. So if you have anything, questions, New Prague, anything, Dennis is your man, and he's going to talk to you today about the Victory Garden and the hobby of gardening. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's great being here today and, and seeing some of my former students who I had in junior high, as, and uh, I guess that dates me a little bit. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's wonderful to see a new generation of uh, peop young people taking leadership roles in the historical society, which when we worked our rear ends off for so many decades and uh, beginning in the early 80s, and so this is really a positive uh, experience for me and I suppose for Alice and Amy at this table. In any event, uh, gardening is just a fantastic uh, hobby and uh, I got involved with ha gardening when I met my wife Linda and uh, the summer before we got married, we took over her father's garden in the backyard when we when I, before we were married, I had my own, in case you're wondering, I had a little, rented a room a couple blocks away, and each day I came and I got my duds on and uh, 
we dug up the garden and uh, harvested, and that was the, my initiation into gardening. Now, I was born and raised in Minneapolis, and gardening in Minneapolis is not was then is not what it like it is today, where you see boulevards planted with flowers and front yards developed into both flower and vegetable gardens. We we live in a renaissance of gardening. And what has contributed to that, it cannot just be Bachman's, it has to be just a younger generation seeing the value of spending time in the dirt. But being, uh, being raised in Minneapolis and living along Bloomington Avenue where American flags flew on the, at the entrance to doors on July 4th, Memorial Day, da 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 da, there was an element of patriotism that was unparalleled. And out of that World War II era, and if you're wondering, I was born in 1943, and out of that, uh, at that time, and, and having five cousins serving in World War II and an uncle, uh, patriotism was on display, as well as victory gardens. And I remember living with my parents and grandparents, there were three generations living in the same home, can you believe it? Uh, we, uh, uh, victory gardens were on topic. And they were developed during World War II. And many, many of you may remember hearing a discussion of that or experienced it. But during World War II from 1941 to 1945, there was a program developed by the United States War Commission, Garden Commission, and their slogan was, plant a victory garden, our food is fighting. The program encouraged citizens to plant a victory garden, to grow produce, and to preserve surplus for the war effort. Now remember, American soldiers, they were in the trenches and they were in both the Pacific and European campaigns. They relied on food rations during the war. And I always remember <laughs> traveling from Germany with my brother-in-law who was a, 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 in the army and he was a, a minister uh, and serving the troops. We ate those war rations all the way from Germany up to Scandinavia and, and Sweden and Norway. And let me tell you, they were not particularly tasty. But the soldiers did rely on that. And as a result, the Victory Garden effort began. At the time, I was born, 1943, 40% of all fruit and vegetables grown in the United States were grown and harvested at home. That's hard to believe. With 15 million families, recorded planting victory gardens, and they were producing 10 billion pounds of food annually. Canning became necessary, popular, and an effective way to preserve food in making sure families ate well during the winter months. Metal cans were in short supply as, because metal was used for the war effort in the production of war machinery. During this time, during the canning era, canning labels were attached to canning jars. And I forgot to bring them, I apologize. Um, they were rectangular, they were red and, had red and blue stripes around the uh, edges. And these were applied to the canning jars um, after the canning process at, the, at canned goods came out of the canning, got out of the canner, I should say. And this was an effort of, for American families, both men and women, to be patriotic and to be part of the victory over Germany and Japan. Family members grew gardens together. And I remember our little uh, house, lots in Minneapolis were not particularly large. The garden was always pushed to the backyard by the fence. And of course, as a kid, we always ripped at them and threw tomatoes at each other. But uh, it, uh, urban families took advantage of family members who lived in the country. Not, not only did they motor to the country and plant the garden, but they always also harvested the garden together. A victory meal at the end of the day was celebrated with families knowing that they were part of this war effort. And the victory garden effort, effort freed up agricultural produce it freed up packaging. It also freed up transportation and resources to reduce the demand for commercially grown produce. Interesting enough, victory gardens were not only planted in backyards, such as mine growing up, but in church properties, city parks, edges of baseball diamonds, 
and playgrounds. I do not remember that as a child, except that uh, because I was too young. But I know that we ate well. We didn't eat extravagantly, but we ate well. Also during this time, there were ration coupons. And that discussion was common in our home because when my grandmother's sister came to, to braid rugs in the dining room, uh, she always filled her coffee cup with big tablespoons of sugar. Well, sugar was one of those commodities that was rationed. And it, it was kind of, my, my mother always reminded us, uh, or reminded me how irritated she was when she uh, did this because it took away from sugar being, being able to use for other things in making cakes and cookies. So the ration books were distributed amongst all families, both men, both women, child, and even babies. Each age group had a limit of coupons they could use. So blue coupon, coupon books, excuse me, were used for processed foods and goods. Red coupons were used for meat, fish, and dairy products. Children had extra coupons given to them for milk and orange juice. The rationing of commodities that was required by of the government were included eggs, tea, coffee, flour, butter, one ounce per person, margarine, four ounces, cheese, sugar, eight ounces, four ounces of bacon, preserves, canned milk, canned goods, oils, lard, dried fruit, shoes, tires, and gas. So obviously, uh, there were not there were not uh, too many families that had two cars in the in the garage, and uh, to purchase a car during this time was very very difficult and and tired buying tires was almost impossible. I have a um, handbook uh, for the garden that was produced by the Northrop King Company, and it's the handbook for the garden garden V for victory. And inside, it gives a detailed account of how to plant a garden, the different vegetables in the garden, how to care for them, what, is, what kind of soil is best suited for them. Now, the Northrop King Building, uh, they produce the packaged seeds. And they're located on Central Avenue in North uh, Minneapolis. And today, these are the Northrop King building is used for artists uh, to have studios. My daughter had one, then had, she had a gallery there. And uh, it's, it's just a reuse of a great space, multi-level, big elevators. And uh, it's just an interesting uh, thing that I had discovered. And, and I enjoy reading through it because I always learn new trips, tricks, excuse me. Another thing that I've picked up over the years and my wife and I have purchased uh, garden books, vintage garden books, and uh, they're on the table here. And uh, some of them are so interesting because they, they discuss topics everywhere from home packing and preserving meats, eggs, vegetables, and fruits. And this was produced by the Red Wing Stoneware Company. The other garden books, one is, very is a very rare and a highly collectible one, Four Edges of the Gardener's Chronicle by Claire Layton. Um, I even have a, perch, I have a book uh, that's uh, on herbs that's all in Bohemian. So even the Bohemian members of the community, uh, of course they were very, uh, were bilingual, some of them, and uh, they were uh, just fantastic gardens, gardeners, excuse me, which leads me into the next discussion, and that is working with my wife, Linda. Now, as I said, we, we started gardening it before we hitched, I see, we met in October, planted the garden in April, married in August, had a kid a year later. So I guess we were really planting the seeds in a different kind of way. <laughs> but, uh, you understand? So, honey, um, tell, you had, honey. honey, so you had two gardens at home yeah. growing up. And one garden was... Uh, well, when I grew up, we lived with Grandpa and Grandpa's house. We had two lots. And the lot that the house was on had a vegetable garden. And that went from front to back. And in, in the second lot was just sweet corn 
and potatoes. And the sweet corn, of course, you know, would have been staggered in planting, so you had it for the whole season. And we had white potatoes and red potatoes. A lot of potatoes and corn. And cabbage for sauerkraut, and that we did too. So in, I think, every, every uh, vegetable you could possibly have thought of, Plus, and in the middle were raspberries and grapes. So we had grape juice for the winter time and had all those raspberries to have freeze for pies or whatever we were doing with them. It was a lot of garden. Just think about it. So, so would you say your family, uh, your, you live with your parents. Your dad came back from World War II. And well, the family was regrouping and establishing their home. They lived with your grandfather, and your grandmother had to, was deceased. Yeah, my, my grandmother passed away, so um, it was just grandpa. So would you say the family was self-sufficient? In many ways. In many ways. The, they always bought, like, I'm sure a lot of people did that, a quarter of a cow or a pig or whatever. And we didn't have free, there weren't freezers in homes at that time. They took them to the meat plant, the locker plant in town. And so every day, Grandpa would go down there and get a package of meat, whatever meat we'd be having for that day or for the next day. So what about uh, poppy seed in, in Caraway? Oh yes, we grew poppy seed. And I heard, and I'm not swearing to this, but I, I heard people from the community say that planes flew over and they were checking for these poppy fields. fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we just grew them for ourselves. And then when it was, you, you, did anyone ever grow poppy seeds for poppies? For poppies? Okay. Um, you would take a bit of the stem and the ball and let that dry and then when it was dry you cut that and take the poppy seeds out. Now also uh, remember that uh, the poppy, for making of heroin, uh, poppies are used and that's the why they were flying over New Prague and Lonsdale also. <laughs> so they're looking for, <laughs> you can identify it because they're bright orange, right? No, 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 no. Not always? No, or, no, no, they were white, pink, and purple, lavender. Oh, little did I know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so in the, in the fall, the, the poppy head was cut, and then you brought it into the house. In a paper bag, mm -hmm. and, dr dry. and dried it. And uh, what about caraway? Well, caraway, yes, we grew caraway also. I'm sure a lot of people did that. And cut that on the stems and let it dry and then shake it off and have caraway. And I think you still have a honey can of... Uh, filled with caraway seed from your grandfather. That's about 80 years old. Yeah. yeah. It's a memory. It's a nice memory, right. Um, so, uh, chickens were also, you, now you lived on the edge of the mill pond, and uh, so uh, Tukulski's chicken hatchery was on Main Street today where Wells Fargo was located. So is that where your family got the chickens? Did you go out there no, and, and no, 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 shoot? No, 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 no. We got those from my uncle's farm. But yes, and we had fences that high with, you know, chicken wire around the top so they couldn't fly over. But Grandpa always, they clipped one of the wings so they couldn't fly. Yeah, and you remember Mr. Chavank, because we were first married and we had an apartment and we had our first child. And, you know, when you're young, you like to sleep late, right? So every morning that damn rooster would crow <laughs> at 5 a.m. <laughs> And it was too warm to, sh to shut the window, but we, <laughs> we and today, memories. and to, yeah, and today when we moved to the country, that's one of my greatest memories, is uh, the days when our neighbors had chickens, and I loved hearing that dock on rooster. But of course, by that time, I was used to getting up early in the morning. So uh, planting gardens also. Um, if you wanted to, you could just couldn't go. But there were no nurseries that we, like we have today. So if you wanted to keep flowers, what did you do? Such as geraniums. What did your mom do? 
Oh, my mother took cuttings, and um, then she recycled all the, the cans from and put them in there. And But you know, they weren't just the cans. She had to paint them. She painted them green so they looked really cute on the windowsill. And she put all those cuttings in there, and then in spring, she had her starts for her drinks. Yeah. So uh, did you have a root cellar at your house? Yes. We had a root cellar, and we had bins for the white and the red potatoes, and that's, we had that. So uh, it always fascinated me being a city kid and coming to the country and driving down here in 1965 and, uh, and escaping the flooding waters uh, on uh, Highway 13 and so on. And, and coming into a community that today even resonates, the love of gardening. Now it's changed. Uh, when uh, we were first married, um, our entertainment was walking around the block in the evening after the kids were put to bed and uh, admiring all the wonderful gardens that were in our, our uh, street. And uh, remember, as I said, these people had gardens primarily vegetable gardens. Flowers were kind of, it's not like today where you do uh, container gardens are more prevalent and where you're, you're trying to do a garden, develop gardens for curbside appeal. This era could give a, could have given a damn about that. They were interested, they needed gardens just to live through the winter. And people were not economically, uh, did not have economic advantages like they do today. One of our, so we, we remember Millie Selosh and Ella Kohot and, Co, yeah, Selar, Ella Kohot and Mr. Lukash and our neighbor, Elois de Vojac and Mr. Kubish, Frank Kubish, uh, Lucille and Francis Nikolai and their father, John. It brings a smile to my face and Linda's face. We had a wonderful neighbor, in conclusion, who was uh, a mail order bride from Bohemia and she was 15 years old. And she came over after World War One, and uh, she, uh, at age 15, can you imagine? And the guy that sent for her was Bohemian, and he wanted a good cook and someone that could speak Bohemian and who knows what else. Well, you can use your imagination on that. Anyway, she didn't like the guy, so she married one of Linda's relatives and lived two doors away, Mrs. Palma, uh, Rose Palma. Uh, it really educated us on gardening. And can you tell her about her rose? Her rose or her husband? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> the rose with a W. Oh, the compost, three compost bins. Oh, yes. She had three compost. This is where we learned this whole thing that I learned in Master Gardening. And she had three compost bins. You first did all your trimming and you put it in the first bin. And you let it sit there for a certain time, then it moved to the second one. And eventually to the third. And after there it had completed the cycle, you could add it to your garden, put it around your plants, nourish your soil. And that, so there was, there was nothing ever put in that. And there was no meat, of course, or bones put into the compost bin. But that, that woman had these compost bins. One woman. That's a lot of compost. And, her, and the rows in her garden were really narrow. Remember, how we, we oh could hardly. Oh my gosh. And then she planted her garden. Well, you know what a garden looks like, and you plant something, and you got that much, that much soil to make a path. You, uh -uh. you couldn't tell where the path was. You just and to hopefully not step on something because she really utilized every inch of it. Oh, and now we have. <laughs> well, I'll talk about the minute. The interesting thing about her gardening was that she, uh, Rose, was that she did not speak English. So after she came here, married her husband, raised two daughters, went through the Minneapolis, the New Prague school system, she never learned a conversational English. So everything had to be communicated through hands, you know, and you know, whatever the case may be. And uh, she, uh, but we, it, it, it all worked. And uh, uh, one summer morning, uh, I got up early and met next door and I found her dead in the backyard. 
She had died in her backyard doing exactly what she wanted and enjoyed in life. After her children and her husband had passed away and her children had left a home, she just seemed rooted as she laid there and uh, in the garden. She was dressed. <laughs> Sorry about that. She was dressed and ready to go into her garden. Maybe that'll be the same like us. You and I, honey. We'll die in the backyard. In any event, she uh, was a wonderful woman, and uh, she always came over with a big plate of open-faced kolach, or kolachki for us, and shared... Yep, yeah, and shared her uh, garden produce. And this is another thing. There was no farmer's market in New Prague. The fresh produce in New Prague st st stores was lousy. And so, if you, I don't know if you remember Emil Dvorak's loose bananas that he was selling for 10 cents a pound. I mean, they were black. <laughs> Absolutely black. And what the heck were you going to do with, <laughs> with black <laughs> bananas? I mean, our monkey never would eat them, right? <laughs> <laughs> in any event, um, it, uh, it, it was a learning experience so I, for us. Uh, so I brought just two items in conclusion. One is Grandpa Novak's. You know what this is, kids? It's not a clothesline, but we had something similar growing up. This was Make the Straight Rose, right? And you take, that, you take one end and put it on a stake, and then you, you could do this all with one person. You just needed one person to make the rope because you put one end on the stake, unwound it, made your line with the hole, and then wound it back up. So I have a t trivia question in conclusion. I want to see if any of you know what this is. I wish I had this when I was teaching. <laughs> Intimidation. <laughs> I'll stick it in your rear end if it'll sit down and shut up, right? Anyway. <laughs> I never had to do that. Yeah. Now, here's an oldie but a goodie. Here, Alice Ill. Yeah. Yeah. It's a. And I bought this at a garage, at a house sale. It belonged to Mary Mock uh, Fitzgerald. This came from her home. Her kids didn't know what the heck it was, what it was, but I knew exactly. It's a dibbler. So you poke the hole. You plant your onion, you plant your seeds, but this is what I, and I've been collecting along with my wife antiques for how many years now? 57 years? One or two. Yeah. And so um, I've never run across one of these. I've never seen another one, but this is one mean t garden tool. Any of you remember, you remember having this, Alice? I don't remember an item like that, but my aunt used to say you put corn in the ground and then each hill, one for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and one to grow. Oh. <laughs> Four, I always thought it was three. Now I learned something new. So in conclusion, I want to just uh, end with a couple of quotes that I found today. To plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. I thought that was really nice. And flowers always make people better, happier, and more helpful. They are sunshine, food, and medicine. Quote by Luther Burbank, our American botanist, horticulturalist, and pioneer in agricultural science. Thank you, and uh, thank you for sharing your day with us. All right. Okay, we are going to Mike, uh, the other master gardener who's going to talk with Dennis and Mike. So I'm just going to do a oh, quick thank you, you while thing? they're doing that. Um, we're here inside at St. Wentz because my mother-in-law is amazing and she helped me get this space because we were going to be at the park and we outgrew that space and we needed an indoor space. So thank you to St. Wentz for offering us this indoor location. Um, also, thank you to Ridges. They, Ridges at St. Creeks, Kozajic Meats, Sugar Rose Bakery. They all helped prov provide the meals for you guys today. Um, and Dennis and everybody, like we said, I, I'm just blown away by all the help we received. I have a couple of things to tell you logistically before the Master Gardeners start. We have free items up here if you want to look at stuff. Um, if you want a lunch, like an additional lunch, we have about 50 more. So we would love people to grab another one on their way out. Like we said before, comments are there. Um, 
If you want to toss it a comment, please do. Next to that is all of the pieces of paper that we had uh, at the gardener's houses that were like the walking museum. So that's posted on our website, and the binder will go to Saint, or go to the library. And it will be in the back of the library towards the back left. We have some cases. So if you want, you can go either look online or go to the library and look at that today. And um, St. Wentz has some scrapbooks of years of gardening over there too. So feel free to look around after we're done with the Master Gardeners. But we'll wrap up Master Gardeners. We'll talk for a few minutes and do a question and answer, and then we'll be done for the day. Yes, hello. Hello to everyone. Um, we're here Good to day. answer any questions you might have about gardening or the things that you saw, questions that you might have. We don't always know the answers, but we know how to get them. So um, ask away. Did anyone have any specific questions? If you do have a question, just raise your hand and I'll come around with this microphone and then um, we can ask that and they can answer it for you. Ooh, no questions. There's one. <laughs> she wants to the know a little bit about the Master Gardeners program. Well, I heard you were one of the beginners in Harvard Scott, so I'll let you yes. tell. Well, not quite as, yeah. I've, I've been at it for 25 years. Um, but, yes, the, the University of Minnesota has the Master Gardener program in all of the counties. Um, and we're in, in Carver Scott. Um, and you take, when you apply to the program, you get interviewed to, um, <clears throat> I guess, decide how well you would relate to people in, in the public setting. Uh, then if you're accepted, then you take the core course, which I think is 50 hours, um, at the university. It's been in various locations. I think it was at the Arboretum, and now it's online, so it's a lot more convenient. And then your first year, you, you are an intern. And you are required to put in 50 hours of volunteer work. Uh, there are people in charge of lots of different categories. Um, we have in Carver Scott, we have the uh, Garden Fever, which happens in the spring in April. Uh, we have a plant sale in August, uh, which most of which uh, the plants come from the master gardeners themselves from their yards. Um, although we do occasionally get, you know, nursery people who will donate material as well. Uh, and then we have evenings in the garden, which takes place at the Jordan Fairgrounds, um, Scott County Fairgrounds Yeah, we have in the, Jordan. The Scott yeah. County Fair is coming up the last weekend in July, and we have a teaching garden over there. So it's um, several gardens that have various plants. Um, we have a pollinator garden and a, an herb garden and different gardens over at the fairgrounds and also in Carver County in As Laconia. Well. Yes. So there's another garden over there. So we work both of the gardens. Yeah, in our community outreach, we do all kinds of things. Besides having people come to us for the teaching part of it, we also work with uh, community gardens, schools, um, nursing homes. Um, what am I missing? Anyway, we have a, we have a lot of out, outreach things. The library, we have a library um, periodically in the winter for um, sessions, teaching sessions as well. So I usually answer questions online for the Ask Extension Foundation in the morning. So if anybody's curious what kinds of issues are going on right now, people are asking me lots of questions about aster yellows. Has anybody heard of aster yellows as a disease? If we have a flower that, like uh, I noticed in Echinacea this morning, if, you know, the cone flower, purple cone flower, if you get really wonky blossoms and they just aren't right, they're all real weird, that's a disease called aster yellows and it's transmitted by a bug. Once the bug feeds on the plant, the whole vascular system of that plant gets sick and you have to basically destroy the plant to get rid of it. So. Um, if you go on the U of M Extension Yard and Garden website, you can punch in in the search engine any question you have. And if you punch in Aster Yellows, there's a ton of information about it. Really um, awesome. 
lots of people are having uh, starting the tomatoes are starting to get ripe so I always prune the bottom branches off of my tomato plants um, so they don't get the blight or disease and they seem to do better so that's another thing you could go on the U of M extension yard and garden website about tomato issues and it talks about all the diseases um, some people are finding fairy rings in their lawn you know like a ring of different colored grass I don't know if anybody's had that and they go oh, what's wrong with my perfect turf grass <laughs> well, that's so, another issue <laughs> well sometimes it's just it's just because of the rain you know and the way the rain washes up and the nutrients might be pooling and you might end up with some mushrooms or you know something that's unusual right in your grass but it will eventually disappear but as master gardeners and i think jackie might agree with me we are not big believers in turf grass or mowed lawn grass and i'm also going to be a pollinator ambassador for the u of m bee lab and we would like to encourage everyone to plant pollinator gardens i think one of the gardens today was a pollinator garden and it was beautiful and there were lots of pollinators in the garden so <clears throat> and that was the garden where they also had the soil water conservation district presentation and i can't remember whether it was han or who it was from the soil water office but um they do have funding for grants for bee lawns and pollinator gardens and we are losing our insects and our birds at an amazing rate so we want to encourage you absolutely to try to support nature as best you can and again you can go to the u of m extension yard and garden website mm -hmm. and put in pollinator party and it'll they get they have a little test of how how pollinator friendly is your yard is your yard that, yeah they like the idea of a bee lawn in other words don't do a monoculture of just grass. Uh, let clover come in there. That's really good. And actually, even dandelions in the early spring, when there aren't many other flowers, especially if we have a very early spring, the pollinators are out there. The bees are out there, and there's no food for them. So we have to have we have to have food available. I think I read someplace it was one third of our food supply is dependent upon pollinators. Yep. That's true. So did anybody have any other questions? I, I actually had a, oh, sorry, Dennis, I'll be right there. I had a, actually had a question. Um, this year I did not plant squash in my garden because uh, I have squash bugs so terribly bad and I just couldn't do it this year. I've heard lots of different ideas how to get rid of them and nothing, none of them have really been successful. What are your guys' thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, squash. Uh, well, what I would do is go to my computer and punch in squash vine borers. <laughs> Um, yeah. Usually it's a squash vine borer and they're pretty easy to identify and I'm not, I don't use herbicides unless I'm killing So just or. manual <laughs> so, removal? Well they yeah. might have recommendations for pesticides or herbicides to use. And uh, there are some. On the website. Organic. Yeah, um, I think you could, solutions. you could, again it's the U of M extension. Yard extension. Yard website. Yeah, extension dot umn dot edu. What are the organics? Um, I think some forms of permethrin are okay, and neem oil um, works. Mm -hmm. it, it works on a lot of a lot of critters. <laughs> yeah, but the squash more they eat into the vine, the stem, and they lay eggs in there. And, and then when you yeah, if you notice it wilting, you take that stem and <coughs> slice it open, and you'll find find the boar. I've actually had zucchini that still produced after the the vine borers were in there. So <laughs> So if you look if you look it up, I mean that that's what I would do. I don't have the answers to everything right off the tip of my tongue. So um, I do have a question and I did I can go I asked you this question when you were at my house and I think maybe uh, some other people have had this question too. And um, my question is, how do you get color in your garden through the growing season? Okay, so she's talking about color in the garden through the growing season. And um, it depends on what plants 
that you're actually going to plant because, you know, there's the spring ephemerals, which are the plants that bloom before the deciduous trees come out. So they will bloom like bloodroot, um, trout lilies, things like mm -hmm. that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there is a website, Heather Holm is a, writes pollinator books, and she has a website um, where you can go, and, and the, one of her charts has flowers listed, native plants from spring until fall, is what will bloom in the spring, what will bloom in the summer, what will bloom in the fall, and I think that might also be on the website. It probably is. Yeah. yeah. And there so, are a number of good books, I think, in the library at the Arboretum, there are a lot of good books reference materials that you can. So I wanted view. to mention too that Nancy Zender is our intern this year. So she's she's in the um, her first year of uh, being a master gardener too. So they um, she comes along with us for projects. But um, you could look up, you know, depending on. And there's another wonderful Minnesota native plant website. And we want to plant natives because. The pollinators have evolved for centuries with the same native plants. You know, uh, the, the pollinators may not know what to do with a lily in Minnesota. Well, and you know. Some of the hybrids <laughs> don't have what the pollinators need. They don't have the food, the, the, the right kind of pollen or nectar. So, so there's that's a great, another reason. The great website, it's called minnesotawildflowers.org, and it's a nonprofit organization, and I have been you know, touting wildflowers for 15 years maybe, and it's the best website I've ever come up with. And it's a nonprofit. It is beautiful about natives. So. I do have another question. Yes. Okay. Um, I have lady slippers growing in my yard, hmm? and they were taken by my father. I think as some of the people have gone through my garden, I told them the story. Uh, they were out in the woods in the small town that they grew up, and there was much construction going on, and the lady slippers were just tossed over. And so my dad and uncle went and got ice cream buckets and put them in there. Am I in trouble for having those in my garden? I don't think so. Not if you. I don't, <laughs> did did I you don't hear? Think so if you rest, did you hear them, what she I said? Not, she did not dig them up from somebody else no, I, or I some wild place. Yeah, no, I would no. never do that. Because you can actually buy lady slipper bulbs. Mm -hmm. I, I think I looked them up at a nursery once, and they, that was quite a few years ago. They were like thirty dollars a piece. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sometimes like the DNR or the highway department will save them if they're building a road or a park, you know, something through where they're growing, and they'll donate them or move them or whatever. So, no, I don't think you could look on the DNR website. Would probably give you that answer too. There's one question way over there. Uh, I, can talk, I can talk pretty loud. Uh, quick question. I know it's a little more tree, but then we'll back for I tried uh, treating them before they got sick, and the chemical that I would buy, uh, Amazon says that it's no longer allowed to live here. I tried it on Google, I didn't see any bottom of that. Is there anything you know that there was a chemical for treating them back for? Uh, and now you can't get any more this year. Last year I bought it, and then this year I actually. Um, I'm not really sure what chemicals they approve and don't approve. I don't um, either, but a tree company person. An uh, arborist. If an arborist would be able to tell you Or a landscape answer. company. Or if you, again, if you go on um, the U of M Extension Yard and Garden website and put in Emerald Ash Borer, it'll go, you know, there the website gets long and there's expandable sections, but it will talk about how to treat it or to find an arborist. And I know there are chemicals that you can use that you can buy yourself and do it to inoculate the tree, but none of them will guarantee you that the tree is going to survive. You know, so, I mean, I have a brother in Colorado who's been inoculating his ash tree twice a year <laughs> for years now. So he's, you know, he's still got it, but there's more ash trees in Minnesota than there are anywhere in the country. And we're losing them at an amazing rate. It's really sad. Um, it's history repeating itself. Did remember? that did that answer your question? Uh, well, <laughs> I guess I'm just not sure. It was just I didn't know if there was a big thing that got passed to block. But it was my trees are not sick yet. But it was just like an annual thing you can put on them. Well, the, I'm pretty sure the chemicals are still available to the public. You know, and I'm not sure what the chemical is or where you get it, but if you can't find it, I would call a nursery or a certified uh, arborist. Yeah. I can yeah. find I said yeah. it to Virginia at my uh, mother-in-law's house and pick it up. <laughs> 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 
Oh, that's kind of scary. <laughs> I, and also, the Minnesota, um, the U of M has a forestry website, and I can't remember what the name of it is. I would just punch in U of M Forestry Lab, and they might have more information. And the DNR has an excellent website on trees. So I do my research there. Yes? Oak, oak will too. I have a six inch oak tree that was vigorous and growing tall and strong. The leaves last year began to thin out a little bit. This year, all of the leaves died. Mm. Oh, ooh, that's a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really hard to diagnose oak wilt um, because last year we had the drought. And it was so bad. And if you didn't water your trees, and it takes trees like a year or two to react. And so I also answer questions for tree care advisors because I'm yeah. a tree care oh, advisor. Oh, you are. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was going to but, say when you're looking at a tree, if it's dying at the top, that's usually something happening at the roots, at the bottom. How did it, did it die at the top? Or did it, do you no, know? It, the, whole thing the whole thing just, was it watered during the drought? Oh, yes. Okay. I think it's I diagnose it as Yeah, if you and, and again, if you go on the DNR website or um uh, forest pest first detector, anyway, the DNR website has if you punch in Oak Wilt, I think they have the map of the counties and the metropolitan counties and up by St. Cloud are the heaviest counties of Oak Wilt. So sorry. Don't know what to say about that. <laughs> Dennis has a question. Uh, what is the uh, thing that you're hearing the most about in regard to global warming and its impact on our zone? Yeah, our zone is moving up. We're, we're getting closer to zone five. And a lot of the, the uh, both animals and plants are also migrating north if they need cooler weather. Um, it's definitely going to have an impact. Will this impact maple trees? I'm not sure about maple. I, they obviously have a limit where, you know, too warm will will cause migration too. But um, and it's a very slow process. They, I think they think that the um, coniferous trees are they going to be the ones for sure that are going to move north. Mm -hmm. But the deciduous trees are like maples. We have a lot of maples, and there's no disease that I know of. Knock on wood, you know, that <laughs> kills them like emerald ash right. or something like that. So maples seem to be doing real well. I think deciduous trees in general probably tolerate the heat better than the conifers altogether. We have another question over here, too. Okay. I actually have two questions. One is, have you seen much evidence of HBX and hostas around this community down south here? Signs of what? HBX in hosta. Oh, I've HBX. heard. I, I just heard of this disease two weeks ago at the arboretum, and okay. I don't know anything about it. Okay. If you're, but, if you're buying hosta from a like Lockman's or a backyard nursery, but you have to be very careful. I only buy from Kelly and Kelly. Or I divide. I never buy from a general nursery because that's where it comes into your garden. So is this is a this is a new disease of hosta yeah. that just kills them all? It's been around for a long time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> if, if, if you have a well established hosta bed or hosta bed like I and my wife have, we don't have any issue. And we just do not bring plants that we do not have with the knowledge of their origin. And their origin. Mm -hmm. But Kelly and Kelly and Long Lake are a good place to buy them because they think them. They do not come in pots, generally. So is your question about the disease then? Oh, I just wondered if you had seen any of that nope. uh, heard of you know, people struggling with that in their yards down here. It's, it's wow. Yeah. I was, not yet. <laughs> where, where are you from? Are you from? Your I live here in Oh. 
Um, I had just been at the Arboretum two weeks ago for a hosta class, and somebody talked about hosta X disease, and I was like, what? I've never heard of this, and I forgot all about it till just now. <laughs> My second question is, is I have a Tina crab apple um, that has suffered from various blights through the years. This year it's looking pretty good, but I noticed aphids at the ends of the um, branches. Can I just leave those? Will it harm the tree for the rest of the season, or should I treat those? Aphids usually don't get to be a big problem. I mean, because they have a lot of predators that'll eat them. I mean, are, is the tree just covered? No, it's not just covered. It's just starting on the You can always hit them with a garden hose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And ladybugs love aphids. That's one of the things that they're after, so. so usually aphids, do, I mean, they aren't going to kill a tree. They might knock it back a little bit, but not usually. I wanted to step in here. I wanted to, uh, the master gardeners are going to be hanging around for a little bit longer. So if anybody would like to um, meet with them and ask them any specific questions that um, you have, you're more than welcome to. And we'd li I'd like to thank you guys so much for coming out. You've been a tremendous resource for us, and we thank you very much. So we, we, we really appreciate you enjoyed out. the gardens. Were beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, this concludes our event. Again, um, just a couple things. If you have any comments, questions, anything like that, around comments or suggestions, there's that box in the back there. Again, um, we're a nonprofit organization. If you'd like to make a donation, you're welcome to toss something in the box back there as well. I believe we have a few extra meals left, so if you'd like to not cook supper tonight, swing into the kitchen and you can take what we have for free. And thank you, everybody. You've made this event a tremendous success. A success. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you to the whole entire team. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful day.